This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about the operation of localization of a ring. So what this means is we're given a ring R and a subset S. And what we want to do is construct a new ring denoted by R S to the minus one. So all elements of S have inverses. So let's start by looking at some examples. Let's just take R to be the ring of integers. And let's take S to be the non-zero integers. So what we do is we take the integers and we force all non-zero integers to have inverses, and it's obvious what we get. Our S to the minus one is just the rationals. Uh, Q. Um, or what we can do is we could take R to be Z, and let's take S to be the number two. So we're just going to invert the number two, and then R s to the minus one is all rationals of the form a over two to the n. So we're allowed twos in the denominator, no other primes. Or what we could do is we could take r to be z and we could take s to be all other primes, three, five, seven, and so on. And then r s to the minus one is equal to all numbers of the form a over b with b odd. And again, a and b rational numbers. And you can kind of draw a picture of the spectra of these rings. So if we draw the spectrum of z like this, so here's the point zero, and on it there are these closed points two, three, five, and so on. Then what are the spectrums of these rings? Well, the spectrum of the rationals is just this generic point here. Um, the spectrum of the ring um, where we um, take all rationals of the form a over two to the n is just um, everything except the prime two. You see, we've sort of killed off the prime two by allowing two to be invertible. Um, and finally, if we take this ring here, um, we've killed off all odd primes, but we've kept the prime two. So the spectrum sort of looks like this. Um, now, uh, we can um, think of localization as being restriction to a subset of the spectrum. Um, so you see this localization kind of corresponds to taking the subset of the spectrum of all points other than two, and this localization kind of corresponds to taking the subset just consisting of two and the generic prime zero. So um, if we were really interested in the prime two and wanted to focus on its problems, we would, we would use this ring here. So we sort of look close to the prime two. And if we were really fed up with two, we would use this ring here. In other words, we just throw two away from the spectrum. Um, so you can also think of this as being um, restriction to places where an element of the ring is non-zero. So the element two of the ring kind of vanishes at this point, so we're focusing on the points where it doesn't vanish in some sense. And um, this might be a bit more obvious with the next example, where I'm going to take the ring to be polynomials over the complex numbers. And here again, I can take um, r equals c of x, and take S to be all non-zero elements. And then R S to the minus one is just the field of rational functions, usually denoted by C with round brackets. So it's just all polynomials PX over Q of X with Q not equal zero.
Um, alternatively, I can take R to be polynomials and take S to be um, just the element um, X. Set with one element X. And then R S to minus one is just the um, ring of all Laurent polynomials. So we're allowed sort of a minus n x to the minus n plus, plus a naught plus a m x to the m. So we're allowed polynomials where we're allowed negative powers of x. So this is all things of the form p of x over x to the something. Um, or I could take r to be c of x again. And this time I'm going to take s to be the set of all things of the form x minus alpha for alpha not equal zero. So here I inverted x minus alpha for alpha equals zero, and here I'm going to invert all the others. And this is the set of all poly, so, so r s to the minus one is then the set of all things p of x over q of x that are defined at x equals zero because um, we're not allowed to take q of x to be x times something because that's not in this set, but we can take it to be x minus any non-zero element. And then this is defined at x equals zero. And if we try and draw the, the spectrum of this, then we get a generic point and we get lots of points, naught, one, minus one, and so on. This, so these correspond to the ideal x, x minus one, x plus one, and so on. Um, and now... Um, the spectrum of, of this one um, is we, we, we've sort of thrown out uh, the, the origin of the complex numbers. So its spectrum sort of looks like this bit and this bit. Um, the spectrum of the purple one, we are kind of throwing out all complex numbers from the complex line except near the origin. So the spectrum kind of looks like this. And of course, the spectrum of the ring of rational functions is, 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 is we, we only keep the generic point and throw out all the points on the generic point. Um, so you can see the reason for name localization. So in this purple example, where we're inverting x minus alpha for all non-zero alpha, we're sort of focusing on the origin of the complex line. So we're sort of localizing means we're just looking locally near zero to see what happens. Um, so uh, you, you notice that this example with R equals the polynomials over the complex numbers and the example with R being the integers are actually very, very similar. Um, the black, red and purple ways of localizing kind of are almost the same. So you can think of um, inverting two in the integers as being very similar to taking the ring of Laurent polynomials over a polynomial ring and so on. Um, the similarity is partly because both of them are principal ideal domains. So how do we construct the inverse um, R S to the minus one? Well, this is very easy. We just take R, we add new variables, T1, T2, T3, and so on, one for each element of S, and we quotient out by the ideal generated by S1, T1 minus one, S2, T2 minus one, and so on. So this forces T1 to be the inverse of S1, and so on. Um, so, um, um, we, we can also see from this that this has the following universal properties. Suppose we've got any homomorphism R from R to a ring T. And suppose the images of the S are invertible in T. Well, we've also got a map from R to R S to the minus one, rather obviously. And there is always a unique map from 
the localization to T, making this diagram commute. And that's kind of obvious because it's just going to map T to the inverse of S in, in, in it's going to map Ti to the inverse of S and T. So, so, so Ti maps to Si to the minus one and so on. And it, it's a very easy exercise to check that this is a sort of universal ring where all the elements at S are local, uh, are invertible in the, follow, in, in the sense that there's a unique map to any ring T with those properties. However, there's a bit of a problem with this. Um, it's sort of unclear how big this is. Because we first of all made it really huge by adding polynomials in a possibly infinite number of variables. And then we've quotient it out by this huge ideal. And in doing this, we kind of lose track about, we sort of lose control over this ring here. It's not quite clear how big it is. For example, we have a map from R to R s to the minus one. And we can ask what is the kernel? Are there any elements of R that map to zero in here? Well, there might be. For instance, if R s equals zero for s in s, this implies that R is equal to zero in R s to the minus one. So anything killed by an element of s has image zero in this. Um, is there anything else in the kernel? Well, yes, uh, we might have R S1, S2 equals zero. Um, and again, if S1 and S2 are in S, then R has to be zero. And similarly, if R multiplied by any product of elements of S is zero, then R has to be zero in this. And you can ask, are there, is there anything else in the kernel that we haven't managed to think of? Maybe there's some clever way of showing that some element of R is in the kernel? And the answer is no, um, but it, we have to prove this. Um, so um, in order to simplify, we will assume that S is a multiplicative subset. So this means one is in S and S1, S2 in S implies their product is in S. And this is harmless. Um, given S, just take all finite products of elements of S and of course one. And this will be a multiplicative subset. And if the elements of S are invertible in a ring, then all the elements of this bigger multiplicative subset will be invertible. So we get the same answer by localizing. So um, th 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 this is a mostly harmless assumption. So this makes, no, makes little difference in practice. Well, if it makes little difference, why are we doing it? Well, um, it simplifies notation. Um, we could perfectly well do this without assuming S is multiplicative, but it would just make notation a bit more tiresome and all the theorems would be a little bit messier to state. Um, so um, let's assume S is multiplicative. And S has no zero divisors. And now we're going to construct the ring R S to the minus one. And this is very easy. All we do is copy the usual construction of the rationals from the integers, more or less. So in other words, we take all pairs R S with R in R and S in S. And it's very difficult remembering what this ordered pair means. So we're going to write this as R slash S. And at the moment, we're thinking of this as an ordered pair, although it will, of course, later turn out to be the quotient of R by the element S. 
Well, that's no good because you remember with rational numbers, a rational number, rational numbers have the probability that two over one is equal to four over two and so on. So we need to put an equivalence relation on these pairs. So we define an equivalence relation. R1 over S1 is defined to be the same as R2 over S2, if and only if R1 S2 equals R2 S1, just as for the rationals. And now we define addition, subtraction, multiplication, zero and one in the obvious way. For instance, we define um, zero should be zero over one, um, that means the equivalence class of zero over one, of course, but it's really tiresome writing equivalence classes, so we don't usually bother. We define multiplication by R1 over S1 times R2 over S2 is defined to be R1 R2 over S1 S2, addition R1 over S1 plus R2 over S2 is defined in the obvious way to be R1 S2 plus R2 S1 over S1, S2. Um, notice um, that here we're using the fact that S is multiplicative. If S wasn't multiplicative, then um, instead of having um, pairs R, S, we'd have to have pairs R and a finite sequence of elements of S, which would be a little bit, just make the notation more tiresome. Um, we also have to define a, a homomorphism from R to R, S to the minus one. And it's obvious how we do that. We just map R to R over one. And here we're using the fact that the multiplicative subset contains one. Otherwise, again, notation would be become rather more tedious. And now we should check um, various conditions. We should check that this is an equivalence relation. Um, secondly, we should check that the operations are well defined. This means, for example, that if R1 over S1 is equivalent to R2 over S2, then this implies that R1 over S1 plus R3 over S3 is equivalent to R2 over S2 plus R3 over S3. And finally, we should check the ring axioms. And I'm not going to bother to do most of this because most of these checks are easy and they're very boring to watch someone else do them. However, there is one of them I am going to do because there is one subtle point. The subtle point is to check that the equivalence relation is transitive. This is the only one of these numerous checks we have to do that isn't in fact completely trivial. So let, let, let's just work through it and see what the subtle point is. Well, we're given that, um, suppose R1 over S1 is equivalent to R2 over S2, and R2 over S2 is equivalent to R3 over S3. We want to show that this implies R1 over S1 is equivalent to R3 over S3. So let's figure out what this means. Well, this just says R1 S2 is equal to R2 S1. And this says R2 S3 is equal to R3 S2. And this says R1 S3 equals R3 S1. Well, so let's try and prove that. Well, from these two, we find that R1 S2 S3 is equal to R2 S1 S3 which is equal to R3, S2, S1. I hope I've got all these subscripts right. Which just says that S2 times R1, S3 minus R3, S1 is equal to zero. And now comes the subtle bit. So this condition implies this if S2 is not a zero divisor.
And this is the point in the proof at which we use the fact that the set S doesn't contain any zero divisors. If S does contain zero divisors, then this equivalence relation need not actually be an equivalence relation. Um, it need not be transitive and the entire construction of the localization breaks down. Um, so, um, uh, well, now we can see that the map from R to R S to the minus one is injective. And this is kind of obvious because R maps to R over one and R over one um, is only equivalent to zero if, if R equals zero. Um, here I should emphasize that this uses the fact that S has no zero divisors. And we will see that this map actually can be, is, is not injective in general. Um, and we also see that all elements of R over S are of the form, sorry, four elements of R S to minus one are of the form R over S and R over S equals zero um, if and only if R is equal to zero. So um, we've got a very nice description of exactly what this ringer is. We know what the elements are and we know when the elements are zero. So uh, let's have a couple of examples of this. So first of all, we can just take R to be an integral domain. S is the non-zero elements. And then R S minus one is just the field of quotients. So this operation of localization is really just a generalization of the construction of the quotient field of an integral domain. Next, we can take R to be any ring, S to be the non-zero divisors. And we notice that this is multiplicative. And then R S to the minus one is called the total quotient ring. And again, the map from R to R S to minus one is injective. And in some sense, this is the biggest um, ring of quotients we can form from R for which R is still a subring. Um, for example, if R is equal to Z times Z, we can see the total quotient ring R S to the minus one is the product of two copies of the rational numbers. Um, well, that does the case when S has no zero divisors. Now let's look at the case when S has zero divisors. Or S may have zero divisors. Well, now we're just going to put I to be the ideal of R in R with Rs equals naught for some S in, in the multiplicative set. Um, well, we'd better check that this is actually an ideal. Um, well, it's obviously closed under multiplication by R, but we'd better just check it's closed under addition. So suppose R1S1 equals zero and R2S2 equals zero, so R1 R2 in the ideal I. Well, then R1 plus R2 is killed by S1, S2. So R1 plus R2 is an I. And you notice we're again using the fact that the set S is multiplicative um, at this point. Um, uh, and now, we see the image of S in R over I has no zero divisors. 
So we can form R over I and then just invert by the image of S. I'm going to denote the image of S by S to the minus one, which is slightly sloppy because the map from S to this ring here need not be injective. And we're going to define the ring R S to the minus one to be equal to this ring here. So we first quotient by the things killed by S and then we invert the image of S. And we can check that this has the universal properties um, of R S to the minus one, which I won't bother doing because it's straightforward. And now um, the key point is we can work out the kernel. The kernel of the map from R to R S to the minus one is I, which is just the set of R such that R S equals naught for some S in S. So the point is, we now we still have control over this ring. Um, so the elements of R S to minus one are all of the form R S to minus one, just as before. And R S to minus one is equal to zero if and only if R times S one equals naught for some S one in S. So we know exactly what the elements are and we know exactly when they are zero. Um, in general, we see that R1 over S1 equals R2 over S2, if and only if S times R1 S2 minus R2 S1 equals naught for some S in S. Um, if you want, you can use this as a definition of an equivalence relation on the pairs R, S and define the ring directly without first defining this ideal I. Um, the trouble is if you use this as an equivalence relation, it's really rather tiresome um, checking everything works. And furthermore, this equivalence relation is kind of non-obvious, looks rather artificial. So I think it's best to construct the quotient by in two steps by first doing the case when S has no zero divisors. Um, so, We'll just have a couple of examples. So the first example, let's take R to be the ring of polynomials in two variables, modulo the ring X, Y. And let's take S to be X, or rather it's multiplicative closure. Then you see in the ring R, S to the minus one, we actually kill off the element y because y times x is equal to zero. So this ring here is just isomorphic to c x x to the minus one. Um, another very important example, which we will be using a lot later, is let, let's take p to be a prime ideal. And let's take s to be the complement of S. And we notice that S is multiplicative because if A and B are not in P, then AB is not in P. So we can form R S to minus one. And this is often denoted by RP um, because it turns up so often. So this is called the localization of R at the prime P. Okay, um, so what we're going to do next lecture is study the relation between R and the localization. In particular, we'll study the relation between the spectrum of the ring R and the spectrum of its localization.